take the leap and trust the process is like the general thing I would say. But I would say because there are so many other therapists who want to take that leap, but are always so fearful of like, what if it fails? What if I am not able to sustain or maintain at least the salary that I'm making at my government job or whatever other job that I've worked so hard to get? Hi, I'm Adrian M. White, and with over a decade of entrepreneurship experience and launching four successful businesses, I know what it takes to grow your business online and live a more purpose-filled life doing the work that you most enjoy. Branding Invert is your go-to resource for branding, marketing, and entrepreneurship advice for service-based business owners looking to scale their business to six figures a year. This is the Brand and Convert with Adrian M. White podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Brand and Convert with Adrian M. White podcast. Today, I am so excited because I have our very first entrepreneur spotlight. Today, I am bringing on Asia Rodriguez, LCPC. Asia is the owner of Zola Counseling Solutions, a therapy private practice based in downtown Silver Spring. Her practice specializes in working with young professionals of color experiencing therapy for the first time. Welcome, Asia. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) Happy to have you. Happy to have you. Thanks so much for joining. So our conversation today is going to be fun. We're going to talk branding. We're going to talk marketing. We're going to talk about how you became an entrepreneur. As an intro, our entrepreneur spotlights are basically interviews of six and seven figure service-based business owners. So Asia is a six figure service-based business owner, and I'm so excited to dive in. So let's get started in Asia. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from and how you got into counseling. Sure. So I I don't know where I'm from. I'm a military brat. So I grew up all over the world and all over the place. Um, But I would say I've, I will call Maryland home because I've lived here most of my adulthood, but I moved back and forth and always came back to Maryland. So we'll just say Maryland in general, but I lived in all the different parts. Um, And so are, are you from Silver Spring? No, um, I okay. <laughs> I would say I've lived in Silver Spring for like five years, but like, but I will call Silver Spring home. It's my favorite place so far, so we'll call it home. Um, okay. But how I got into counseling, um, so I knew I wanted to be a therapist or psychologist or something since I was in second grade, and then I just kind of stuck with it. And then um, when I was older, I mean, as I got older, I explored some other career paths, but then realized like I actually really like helping people. Um, I come from a family of helpers and people who were like foster parents or nurses or things like that. And that kind of led me to this space of, I really want to make a career out of this and do it in a different way than people in my life may have been accustomed to. Awesome. So Asia and I are actually, we used to be neighbors. We met in a workout class, like downstairs of our building and quickly, you know, became workout buddies. And now both of us don't go to that gym anymore. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, representing Silver Spring. You got to represent. Yes. So Asia, (laughs) tell us a little bit about your path to entrepreneurship, because I know that like with counseling, you could work for a practice. There's like a lot of things you could do that aren't, you know, you working in private practice. So tell us how Mm -hmm. you got into private practice. Yeah. So I actually did just about every other path before I realized, like, actually, I just want to do the private practice thing. I always knew I wanted to do private practice, but was like, maybe that'll be the end goal when I'm closer to retirement. That'll be something that I do to slow things down a bit. Um, But working in this field, there's so many, there's a, there's a high demand. And so um, you go whatever uh, path you go, you're going to be busy. And so I went from working in community mental health settings. So like, federally qualified health centers, which are basically like health clinics that have all types of different healthcare providers under one roof. Um, I worked there for a while. I did. I was a school-based therapist for a while. I was a home-based therapist where I went to people's homes. Um, I worked in a methadone clinic. I worked in just about every avenue of where you could be a therapist and worked in crisis intervention for a while, worked in hospitals, literally everything, and realized every single place 
is going to burn you out for not a lot of money. And so they want you to see clients back to back, no breaks, want you to specialize in trauma and deal with some pretty heavy stuff, but not give you the opportunity to like take time off when you want to pay you a reasonable wage and then give yourself the breaks and time that you need. And we were preaching mental wellness in all these different spaces, but yet not allowing the therapist in, in those spaces to actually take care of themselves. So I kind of jumped into the private practice world pretty quickly because I realized like this is not sustainable. And in fact, I was reaching a point where I was like, if I keep working in these types of settings, I'm not going to want to be a therapist anymore. And I didn't dream about this in second grade to be burnt out three years in the game. So that's when I started kind of building my practice slowly in about 20, and in mid 2019 is when I started building it and was like, I'll just at least like lay the foundation. And then whenever I'm ready, I'll at least have things planned out and figured out. Um, and mm-hmm. then I ended up getting let go from my job at one point, which kind of expedited the process because they ended their contract with the like local government agency. So that expedited the process a little bit. Then I found another job, then COVID happened. So then all these things just kind of led to a place of, oh, I'm not just building it. I'm actually just going to start it and just like start advertise myself, see what happens, put myself on the internet and see what happens and immediately started getting requests. So I was doing it part time for about two years before I was like, you know what, I'm ready to just do it full time and this be my main source of income. And here we are. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Yeah, it's so funny. So I actually I've been let go from I think four jobs. And the final let go led me to jump into the full time entrepreneurship too. So it's interesting how being let go sometimes can kind of push you to try your own thing. Yeah. It's funny because I, you know, Facebook shows you memories of things, statuses you write. And at one point I wrote a lot of Facebook statuses, but one thing I wrote in 2018 that recently came up probably right around the time I decided to do this full time was me saying like, this has been a blessing in disguise to have been let go because I'm actually like building, you know, starting my journey to self-employment and building things, these things. And then literally three year, I think the three year or four year mark or something like that was when that uh, came up. But that was when I was like one month into being fully self-employed. So I was like, oh, wow, like this is so amazing that that was what pushed me. And then now here I am. That's great. I love that. I love that so much. (laughs) So, okay. So you were working for other organizations and then you went full time. How many years ago um, was it when you were full time? So I went full time only earlier this year. So I was... I guess technically I was kind of doing full-time caseload by the end of last year, but this was in January is when I decided to say, okay, I'm cutting, cutting the cord of all the benefits and all the other things that come with having another job and just fully focusing on uh, my practice. What, um, what steps did you take to actually like prepare for that full-time entrepreneurship? Because like, as you mentioned, it's like health insurance, you have to pay for it now and like other things that you probably didn't have to worry about that much before. Like, what did you take to prepare for that job? So the biggest thing was the health insurance. I had to figure that out. I was like, I, everyone I know that has a private practice part-time, but is like scared to take that leap. Like almost always the concern is, but what about health insurance? Because paying for health insurance yourself is so expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So when I was like considering going ahead and cutting the cord from the benefits from my full-time job, I calculated one to see how much it would cost for me as being a single person and not having a family and things like that. But then two, to calculate, okay, if my rate per session is this, how many sessions would I need? How many additional sessions would I need to have to be able to cover that additional cost I'd have to take on and just kind of calculate that into how much how many clients per week do I need to aim to have to be sustainable to both meet my needs and be able to have some additional income (laughs) Um, and not just be feeling like I'm paying bills all the time. So six figure entrepreneur, tell me your journey. Mm -hmm. How did you get to six figures? Was it was it challenging? Or you just sort of like, you had the momentum going and you just you just made it there? Did you have any bumps in the road getting there? Oh, there were a lot of bumps in the road. But <laughs> what I will say, what I will say is that I think 
for one, having like done it part time first before I took the leap was helpful because I, some of the things I invested my money in initially, I didn't have to do because I'd already invested in the things I had to spend a lot of money on. I did when I had another source of income. So I think that helped a lot. But I think initially I was hoping, OK, OK, I'm going to have this full caseload. I have all these people want reaching out for services like this is going to be great. I'm going to be full so quickly. And then it would be things like, oh, all these pop up expenses have come up. So now all this extra money I made is actually not accounting for anything. And actually, this number that I thought I needed, I maybe need to add a little more because people do cancel appointments or reschedule or discontinue services for one reason or another. So I had to make sure I accounted for some and like added some buffers in there to make sure that I wasn't like banking on if I don't see this many clients a week, I'm not going to make my financial goals. And so um, I think the first thing was having that reality, that reality kicked in real fast. But then the other thing too, was trusting the process um, because they, because I take insurance, one of the challenges is that sometimes insurance payments are delayed or they take a few weeks to process or they'll deny a claim four weeks after you submitted the claim. And then you're waiting on payments that are just denied altogether and you have to resubmit. So when that was happening, initially I was like, freaking out like I was, it was a point I think maybe like two months in that I was like why did I do this to myself am I cut out for this I didn't account for this I don't have enough money saved to girl survive. like all girl. of those questions <laughs> story of my uh, life like <laughs> every other month yeah <laughs> and literally like I said right in from the very beginning those are all the like why am I doing like and I uh my mom had to be like my supportive ear to kind of be like it will work itself out Worst case scenario, you can find some other sources of income and do what you need to do, but it will work itself out. You have to trust the process. And sure enough, trusting the process and knowing that like what I have to offer is valuable and people will come. There's going to be ebbs and flows when there's going to be times when you're super busy. There's going to be other times when things are really slow, but it doesn't times being slow doesn't mean that it's going to be that it's a failure or that things are not going to work. But if you get so caught up in that and like trying to make your exit plan and everything else, then like you won't succeed. So once I actually embraced that, then it was like, okay. And I was able to really like plan and strategize to be able to say, I need to hire people to get the support that I need so that we can meet the need of the people who are reaching out to us. And it may not always be me providing the service. It may need to be other people. So that was the lesson I learned very early on is I don't want to burn myself out seeing too many clients because that defeats the purpose of me switching over to private practice. But the way to really build the ink, the revenue that I want is to hire a team, get other people to be hands on it and not be just me all the time. Great advice. Did you have like a business coach or anybody that kind of guided you on how to even run a private practice and like the things that you should be doing? Or did you just figure it all out yourself? I didn't have like an individual coach that I worked with one on one, but I did one. I took advantage of all the resources on the Internet of like people who offer like there are a lot of private practice business coaches who will do like the three day boot camp or the whatever thing to get you to join their bigger co uh, course or the or to do their one on one coaching. So I took advantage of some of those. And then I invested in the ones that I felt like were really beneficial for me. So some of them, they're not necessarily going to be aligned with what I with, with what I think is important or the things that I want to focus on for my practice. Because a lot of times the private practice world, it's tricky because it's a business, but it's also you're in a helping profession. And if you have prices that are like too high and you're supposed to be catering to people who are have never been to therapy before and whatever else, there may not be as many people willing, knock, knocking down your door trying to see you. And so, but there are a lot of private practice coaches who emphasize like raise your rate just raise your rate and so sometimes it's like okay raise the rate but also stay in line with my mission but also make sure I make enough money to survive so a lot of coaches the ones who are focused on raise your rate only I was like I don't think they're aligned with me but the ones who are like do what you need to do to build your business so yes you're raising your rates in some ways but you're also doing other things hiring teams having other people generate revenue etc those are the ones who are more aligned with me so I invested in like a it was a course like a it wasn't a one-on-one -on -one coaching, but they did have a lot of coaching calls with the group, um, but it was a course. And that, so that was really helpful in all the things I didn't already find online or find from these other like quick bootcamp ones, I was able to really fine tune. So the things like, especially with like business and accounting and things that are just not, that therapists are usually not well-versed in. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How did you even find the course? Like, where did you find it? Um. Hmm. Uh, so I think most of the ones I found were, so there's a Facebook group called Clinicians of Color in Private Practice. And that's pretty much where there's like 
thousands of other black therapists in across the country who are all just kind of bouncing ideas off of each other. And so then within that, there's some marketing and there's some, I found this person, they were really helpful and just kind of immersing myself in the industry and kind of talking to other therapists who were in private practice and seeing who they worked with and things like that. So some people, it was just like, just literally in being in those Facebook groups all the time and stalking all of the, thing, the posts on those groups was helpful, but then also just, you know, the algorithms on Instagram and things like that. Once you start clicking on some, the other ones will come up too. So then it was like, oh, so then I went down a lot of rabbit holes of, oh, this person is just a regular business coach, but this one is a specifically this type of coach, like, and just literally just every day was spending hours on the internet. And then that's how I started running across a lot of them. So how many people do you have on your team currently? We have one other clinician, but we hide, we have a conditional offer out for another clinician, but she's waiting to get her license in this state. So she, she recently moved here from Connecticut. So we'll have two clinicians and then we have two care team associates. So I have a care operations manager, which is, she's like my virtual assistant, but she's then transitioned more into doing more than just virtual assisting. So I, I consider her a very integral part of my team. And then we have an um, undergrad intern that she kind of supports with every other role. She just doesn't do, she doesn't do therapy. So she does everything else and helps wherever else we need. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have an IT person, which happens to be my mom. Um, so she's also <laughs> on the staff to make sure that since everything <laughs> nice. we do, everything we do is a paperless practice. And my mom is a cybersecurity professional. So she kind of helps make sure that we're not violating HIPAA things, that we're um, that all of our processes are uh, secure. Do you have any recommendations on how other clinicians or therapists can, you know, find a team? Let's say they don't have anybody they know currently that um, can help them out. How did you find some of the other people that you're working with? I would say that, how did I find my VA? Uh, so Arian, I think, actually, it was just word of mouth, honestly. And so... Like I, what I will say is it has been a blessing for the clinicians that have found me because I, they sought me out before I even decided I wanted to hire people or hire additional clinicians. Virtual assistant that I have that's now my care operations manager, she, I think we have a mutual friend or something. Someone else just happened to post her and share her information. Then I was like, you know what? I have been looking for a VA. Let me look into this. And so I also have found that there's like virtual assistant job boards and things like that. Again, Facebook Thing, Facebook groups and things like that of people who share some of their expertise and share some of their resources and just kind of ask around. So not being afraid to ask for who is your VA? Who is your billing person? Who is your, like, who have you used in the past and who would you recommend? Because um, mm -hmm. even if you don't know someone, even if that, like, they don't know someone, they can say, oh, I might know someone who does know someone. So I don't have a VA, but Asia has a VA and she might be able to really help you with, uh, she might be able to refer her person. And so asking around. <laughs> okay. So I'm looking at your background. And for those who are listening in on the podcast, go to YouTube so you can see Asia's beautiful office right now. And your logo is like amazing. It's all gold and really modern. You have the wallpaper going on. So I'm assuming this is all part of your brand. Like how did yeah. you get your brand together? Yeah. So this is my second version of my brand. So initially when I first created my website, it was just, like I said, I was just kind of like, oh, I'm just going to build the foundation. No, like pieces and just like make a website. So if people look me up, they'll see me online. And I just made a quick logo on I think Taylor Brands or one of those like logo generators and then it had a brain on it. I just felt like it was very simple but it was just to like it was one of those things where I was like I don't want to like m wait till everything is perfect to do it I'm just gonna make something and I can always go back later and change it and I ended up changing the whole website and the logo and the colors and everything probably like nine months in <laughs> um, and so <laughs> uh like I said once I realized like okay the, like I'm actually doing the practice now I wanted to find um, something that kind of symbolize like that I prioritize or I have that we specialize in working with people of color and embracing different cultures and things like that. So I tried to have something that was a little more, I don't just say a little more ethnic. So I was like, I want something that kind of embraces that. Um, and so the colors and things like that, I did some research on brand colors. I still ended up using a logo generator for the actual logo, but I try to be intentional about what colors and fonts and things that I'm using that are more aligned with, that will kind of be clear that we're about embracing cultures, ethnicities, backgrounds, etc. What's a logo generator? Like, where do you go to? Do it's that? like a, <laughs> it's like a website where you put in um, they have different versions of them. Some of them are not that great, but some actually are like, oh, this is pretty amazing. And so you 
you put in your brand name, your company name, then you put in like what industry it is. And then you kind of pick some different icons, what you feel like represent your business. And then you kind of pick, do you want it to be trendy, modern, classic, whatever type of style. And then it shows you different types of logos. And then from there, you kind of pick which ones you really like. And then it'll put your info, the things that you put about your business there. And then from there, you kind of can tweak it to say, I want a different font or I want this to be circular and not square, like all those different things. And then um, some of them, they're like very extra. So they'll say, okay, from there, we'll set up the like brand kit to say, these are the colors. These are the things we want. This is the type of um, image that this looks good on versus not. These are the printable versions, all those different things. So the more thorough ones do that, but some of them are just like you put in your your company name and then pick your colors and then it's like, okay, here, do you like this? And they're a little bit more simple. Yeah, so that's do you have to I, pay for it? Yeah. Some, I mean, you can do a free version, but I just paid for it because it gives you all the different versions of the logo. Um, so some have like the transparent background or they'll have like the, you know, the white background or the black and white version and all the different versions. But if you get the free one, I think you I think you can only get one version of it. That's so cool. If you remember the name, feel, please drop it in our conversation or we can have a little follow-up yeah. um, to drop it because it's really cool. I've never heard of that before. <laughs> yeah. What I will say though is like the downfall because I know like when I do, whenever I do rebrand, because I know eventually I probably will, but when I do, I probably will just get like a custom logo made because this helped in the short term of I don't know who to hire I don't have the time to like think about these things this helps me and this gives me a vision and I really like it I'm gonna run with it but I think now especially as my business expands and as I'm more clear on what I do want I think in the future I probably would like actually hire someone to make it what it make it as amazing as it could be (laughs) yeah Um, us hire us (laughs) that's what we do (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> awesome. Let's kind of switch over to marketing. So how do you get your current clients and are there any marketing like strategies that you're following that you would recommend to? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, and this is like a continuous learning curve now that I hired other people. I'm sure you're enjoying this episode, but I wanted to quickly pop in to let you know about how you can grow your service-based business to six figures a year today by learning how to better market it online. Join my exclusive membership community, Marketing Maintenance, for as little as $49 a month and learn how to develop and implement effective online marketing strategies that bring in more leads while also keeping your WordPress website protected and up to date. This program includes website updates, site maintenance, monthly marketing trainings, one-on-one marketing strategy meetings, and marketing deliverable creation. Join today at marketingandmaintenance.com. Learning curve now that I hired other people. Uh, I think the biggest thing is knowing who your target audience is and what they want to hear and where they would look for you. Because like I primarily get my clients from therapyforblackgirls.com and blackfemaletherapist.com because we primarily work with young professionals of color. And so I was like, I don't necessarily want to start on the like traditional therapy directories and um, advertisements. Like I'd rather focus on the places where the people we want to work with would be going to search for it, actually search for it there. And so, and then the second part of that is then, like I said, knowing what they want to hear. So I've had to play around with the clinician that works under me. She's a newer clinician. She's still learning the things that she wants to specialize in and stuff like that. So it was a little more challenging in the beginning to write her like copy for everything. And because it was like, I don't know how to write. I know how to write for myself because I know what I like to work with and I know what I love doing, but also making sure that her message is clear, the type of people she really enjoys working with. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think that was like a really crucial component of it um, is really like one narrowing down who do you want to be your ideal client? And so over time, one one of the things I learned was like, what is my ideal client? Who are they? Where do they work? What do they do? What are they coming to you for? How can you help them? And then kind of figuring out how to speak to that person in whatever marketing efforts you're doing. So for us, like I said, it's a lot of therapist directories in particular. Uh, But even because we work with a lot of people who have never been to therapy before, then we also do like social media things that are more specific to 
mental health 101. So how do you find a therapist? Where do you, how can you use your insurance? How, you know, like different things that someone who's never been on this journey before would want to know. Uh, and that mm-hmm. has helped pull in people too, even surprisingly, because we, I feel like we weren't putting as much effort into social media as we probably could. But mm-hmm. even then some people were saying, your social media really resonated with me. And I'm like, oh, so it is working. Okay. <laughs> so this is great. This is <laughs> nice. <laughs> how, are, how do you think people are even finding you like on social media? Are you doing any ad- paid advertising or is it all working? Uh, I've done some paid advertising. I would say I, I'm i also curious of how people find me on social media because what I'm finding is there are a lot of other therapists that follow me on social media that more so than, well, I, I mean, I don't know if there's... I would say there are a lot of other therapists that follow me. And so I don't know if they're just also sending it out, um, sending out like pages and stuff like that. But like I said, most of our referral sources are from the different therapist directories and websites. Maybe I do have the social media link to some of those. So they probably are coming from that too. So in regards to your website, do you one, have a website? And two, do you feel like having a website is necessary for a therapist or for a private practice? I have a skewed view. I say yes, 100% is necessary. I have a website. I did it myself because I like doing those. I think in a, in another world, I would try to be a website designer or something like that. But I, <laughs> I don't have the... I, I think I know how to do it for myself and maybe not as much for other people, though. That's the problem. <laughs> so that's okay. why, like in another world. But you have that I little the... <laughs> creative gene there. Yeah. Or whatever and, to be and, able to make something nice. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's less about the creative part and more just like I have an interest in tech. And so and with my mom working in tech and things like that, it's always been intriguing to me. So that's why I, like, the, the website stuff is great. But I tried to make one for someone one time. And I was like, you have a very different vision than I do. So I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> so I was like, this is why this is not my my avenue. But, but I would say for me, I being a younger woman, I think it's really important to have a website because for me, when I'm looking at businesses and things like that, the first thing I do is like, okay, what's their website? And I'm trying to find their website. I would say even more so than their social media pages. And so mm-hmm. especially Same when it here. comes to, yeah. And and so when they don't have websites, I'm like, I don't know, is this a valid business? Like, I'm not sure. Like, And not yeah, to say that. That's, that's, exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what I'm thinking. Like whenever I like am sourcing anything, including a therapist and like pretty much anything, looking to hire someone, yeah. I probably first will, sometimes I'll see their social media first. So I see mm-hmm. that and I'm like, okay, but I always Google them and I always try and find their website. And if I see that the company does not have a website, I, I won't do business with them because if they burn me, I feel like it was my fault. Like I didn't do my due diligence in looking at their reviews, looking at you know, information that would be on a website. (laughs) Exactly. And that's exactly how I feel. And so like, sometimes people will recommend people to me and I'm like, oh yeah, that's great. But I don't see a website. I don't see a booking page. I don't see anything. So I don't, I don't trust this. (laughs) And I'm not, it doesn't matter how amazing you said it is. I'm not trusting it. Right. Like, is it even a legit business? Like, yeah. mm -hmm. (laughs) And, and I look at it from the lens of like, and I, I had a rant about this on Instagram one day because I look at it from the lens of like, that's showing me that you've invested into your business, at least at minimum that you have a website that people can be directed to, um, to say like, these are the services we offer. This is how to get in touch with us. Like the basic information, like even if you only have a landing page, like that is better than like me trying to find the right number and hope that this Google, let's Google my business page is legit and whatever. Like I, I, want to see that you've done your due diligence to invest in your business and that I'm willing to also invest in whatever service you're providing or whatever product you're providing. So for me, I felt like that's why I said like my first thing before I even had all the business plan and idea figured out was I'm gonna make a website. And that way I'm <laughs> at least out here on the internet and people Google my name, I will come up, but I will mm-hmm. flesh out all the details later. And so I would say the same thing applies for like, in, like you said, the question about whether or not people in private, other therapists in private practice should have a website. I would say, yes, I would say what I, the trend I noticed is that a lot of older therapists who've been in private practice for 20 and 30 years don't have websites, not to say they, none of them do, but but most of the time, those are the people I see that don't have them. But when people tell me, oh, this therapist is great, I'm like, I have absolutely nothing to go off of except this one person's word and experience. The type of work you do in therapy is such a like sensitive space and you want to be able to like trust that this therapist is going to really be able to support you. You're, you may be vulnerable with them, et cetera. I feel like having a solid foundation 
i.e. website, but also like processes and things like that can help someone feel more comfortable with, I can trust you. I've read a little bit about you. You, you were, it's very clear what you have to offer. You know, it's very clear of how to get in touch with you, all these different things to make me have that, that buy, get the buy-in from a customer or a, cl- a client to say, okay, this, she seems legit. I want to give her a chance. Right. Yeah, totally. A hundred percent agree. (laughs) We're thinking about. So as an entrepreneur, so you said you've been, it's been about 10 months now of you being like a full-time entrepreneur. What's one of the biggest challenges you had to overcome in this last 10 months of being a full-time entrepreneur? I would say trying to like not overdo it because now I feel like I'm like, okay, so I have, now I have a nice flow. I'm like, I have like, see clients on a regular basis like you know things are working now what should I add this should I add a course should I do these should I do trainings like and it just becomes this thing where I can easily overwork my brain trying to figure out what the next move is going to be because like I said it part of like service-based businesses is that your income is generated based on something you're doing and so I'm like okay well if I can find other ways to generate revenue without me having to always be available and have a, an hour block of my time to do it, then I should do that. So then it's like, okay, so what would my course be about? What this? And, and just kind of go down these rabbit holes of trying to plan things and set things up. And the next thing you know, I'm like, I created the schedule to have time to do things I want to do, but yet I'm still up late doing things and whatever else. So I think that's been the biggest challenge of like, pace and also knowing that like I don't have to get everything done I don't have to do everything and be a part of everything that therapists do to make money and just pace myself figure out what works for me of course continue to work on the business to expand it and make it be what it truly could be but also not putting pressure on myself to do all the things Mm -hmm. that's that's really good advice and that just made me think about so yes as service-based businesses you know, we all offer a service that is either going to require our time to fulfill it, or it's going to require maybe somebody else on our team's time. What are your thoughts on like different products or services business owners having products like courses and things? And do you have any that you offer? Mm -hmm. I think that they could be beneficial. I have skewed views because I've, I've tried to support other businesses and buy their courses. And then I'm like, this is it. Like I paid this for this very minimum information I could have easily Googled. And so I know that that's not the reality for most, like for everybody, but I think sometimes you have to be mindful of who is really trying to make every dollar they can make and just offer something quickly. That's really nothing versus who actually is providing the quality content and things like that. So for me, I think it, it could be very advantageous, which is why I am would like to go in that direction soon. I actually recently invested in like actually having a nice camera and doing some different things to be able to start that process of creating a course. But I'm also big on like, I don't want people to feel like they wasted their money afterwards. So I want to make sure that it's quality content. I'm not just like producing, 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 and not really producing anything of quality. So I think it's a good thing and could be a great income generating tool. But as long as you're not saying, oh, because I like, for instance, I did one, it was like a business credit one of like, oh, how to get business funding and financing. And literally it was like, get a DUNS number, get a EIN, do a trade line. And it was like, beyond that, there wasn't much fruitful. There was no resources, no anything. And I was like, you oh, can no. literally Google that and find all of those things. <laughs> and I was like, that I was like, this is nothing more than what you said in your Instagram videos and whatever else. I thought you were going to dig deeper, give tips, tools, tricks, whatever. But um, right. so that's the thing is like kind of making sure it's not just someone who's like Instagram famous, who was like, yeah, I have 40,000 followers. So you should pay for this course. That's going to say a bunch of nothing. <laughs> 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 right. And I feel like that goes, goes back to like doing your due diligence, reading mm-hmm. reviews, like <laughs> real review, hopefully the real, yeah. um, of yeah. like the actual course and stuff. Cause a lot of times, yeah, it's like we, someone's an industry influencer or they have a big following and stuff mm-hmm. and people are quick to buy from them because of the following, but it's doesn't necessarily mean that they have any content and people that have big followings don't necessarily have a business or have a profitable business, you know, just yeah. have that. Yeah. So that's why I've been like, okay, just being mindful. And for me, what I found is like following that account for a while and just kind of paying attention to 
what are they, when they are doing lives or when they are doing different things, are they providing quality information that I feel like, okay, I really do want to learn more? Or is it just, I happen to fall across this person who says, limited time only, my course is this this very low price. And then I say, oh, okay, I'm going to take it and impulse and realize that, wait, you actually don't provide quality. So it's like, I follow you first, fill you out, pay attention to comments, pay attention to things. It's like, okay. I, I can trust you now. I'm ready to go ahead and invest in this. Well, it's about time for us to wrap this interview up. I thought it went wonderful. Thank you for all the really valuable information that you provided today. Asia, what is some words of advice you have for a clinician or therapist that really wants to go into private practice and wants to grow to six figures? I would say, I probably said it earlier, but like take the leap and trust the process is like the general thing I would say. But I would say because there are so many other therapists who want to take that leap, but are always so fearful of like, what if it fails? What if I am not able to sustain or maintain at least the salary that I'm making at my government job or whatever other job that I've worked so hard to get? And I say like, when you take the leap, like you're able, you have the time and opportunity to figure it out and don't have to bring yourself out in the process. And everyone I know, Literally everyone I know, and I know a lot of therapists in private practice, kind of said the same thing. Like Once I actually did it, I realized mm-hmm. it's not as hard as I was making it out to be. But when I was trying to juggle working 40 hours a week here and then trying to figure all that stuff out on the side while tending to family and tending to all my other needs, it did seem impossible. But when I actually took the leap, relied on faith, trust the process a little bit, then I was able to like, oh, I can figure this out. I can make more sense of this. I have more time and, and mental clarity to do it. So take mm-hmm. the leap. Trust the process. No, there's going to be moments where you have summertime is really slow. When, uh, uh, holiday time is slow. Oh, there's going to be slow periods, but you can very well get through those those slow periods and thrive and make six figures and not have to just barely be hitting six figures either. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like there's any financial preparation they need to do before they take the leap? I would say yes, but that's because I can get really anxious if I don't have some type of financial plan in place. But I guess I know a lot of other people who they're like, I can't do this anymore. And I'm just going to go ahead and start my private practice now and and figure it out. Who said like, I didn't have much saved. I have a small savings or I spent all my savings doing all the things to get everything set up or to get an office space or whatever else. And it still worked out for them. For me, I was like, I'm going to, I'm putting money to the side in an account months in advance to make sure that I have some type of cushion just in case. But I, even then, like the initial goal I had of I'm going to have six to 10 months of savings of like of all my expenses of, so that if I, if it doesn't work, it, you know, I didn't have that. And then mm-hmm. there were other expenses that quickly dwindled that anyway. But um, I would <laughs> right. say like having some type of plan in place, I would even say like, if it comes down to it, where you feel like you're not quite like financially where you want to be but ready to take the leap like doing something prn or something so that you have some opportunity to make some extra money while you're still working out the kinks or especially if you're like starting what's, very fresh in the beginning what's prn prn just means i don't know what it actually means but it pretty much just means where you pick up shifts somewhere so like i used to work prn at the hospital nearby and I'm not on the schedule, but if there's shifts available, I have the opportunity to pick them up. So that way it's like, mm-hmm. I know I can have a chance to make some money here and there if I know I need to, or if I mm-hmm. know things are slow, or if there's just like I had an unexpected expense, but don't want to d- dive into whatever business income or whatever, then I can say, I'll pick up a couple shifts. Uh, so mm-hmm. I tell people too, like, that's a, a backup option if you feel like I don't have the money, enough money saved, but also want to make sure I'm not picking up because the, the the challenge is like you don't want to pick up more and more clients and then because you're in a like low point because with clients you have to see them every week and if you say I'm just gonna pick up five more clients to make up for this big bill I had to pay then you have to keep seeing those five clients until the end and so it's easy to bring yourself back out so the alternative is like either have the money saved or have a plan of what will I do to make extra money if I need to makes a lot of sense great advice So Asia, thank you so much for coming today. Let everybody know how can they get in touch with you? How can they find out more about Zola Counseling? And what are all your socials? Yeah, so you can visit our website, ZolaCounselingDMV.com. You could also visit us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Zola.CounselingDMV. 
Oh, yes. Those are all the socials that we have. So okay. Instagram, <laughs> Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and our website. Our website is our main thing. So even if you're like interested in services, things like that, all of our socials will redirect you back to the website to schedule a phone consultation. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming today and yeah. being the first up, <laughs> the fresh meat. <laughs> Yeah, this is I'm my really... first podcast, so I'm excited. So... Oh my gosh, so excited. Yeah. This is probably like my first podcast. Too. Well, no, it's not my first podcast. It's my first time um, interviewing for a podcast. Oh, nice. <laughs> Yay, well, you did great. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. So thank you so much for coming. We will share all of Asia's you know, contact information and Zola Counseling's contact information if you're interested in learning more about what she does or working together. And until next time, we will see you guys later. Ciao. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. You made it to the end. We have more amazing episodes coming up just like this one on the Brand and Convert with Adrian and White podcast. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at brandwithamw and learn more about working with me at brandwithamw.com. People always ask me how I scaled my business to six figures per year and now work full-time in my purpose. After a decade of being an entrepreneur and launching four successful businesses, I know what it takes to get your service-based business to six figures per year quickly. Start booking higher paying clients, automating your processes, and clarifying your messaging in my free training, five strategies my clients are using to develop brands, websites, and processes that grow six-figure businesses. Secure your seat today at training.brandwithamw.com. See you there.